There's a spirit of Elijah that is on prophets and intercessors today. Apostles and prophets and teachers are gathering together and they're proclaiming the word of the Lord with a fiery anointing. And it is totally irrational because there is faith that's flying in the face of all of the evidence. What you see is in many cases a deception and an effort at manipulation. I want to tell you the only safeguard right now to be protected from error is the fear of the Lord. Let me read a section of scripture out of Malachi about the fear of the Lord. Malachi was the last of the Old Testament prophets whose works are in the Bible. And between the book of Malachi and the first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, a span of 400 years occurred, a span of silence from God in which there were no prophets. But hear what the Lord had to say. The last thing that he said under the old covenant to Israel until John the Baptist arose, and interestingly, John the Baptist was said to have the spirit of Elijah upon him. So there is a connection between this last book of the Old Testament and the first book of the New Testament. I'm going to read from Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. Did you know that your conversations are, over, are, are listened to? They are being overheard by the Lord. And those that speak to one another out of the fear of the Lord have a special blessing because it says, and, the, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. So be mindful of that even in your ordinary conversations. The Lord is listening. Verse 17, they will be mine, these that fear the Lord, these that res respect him and esteem his name and speak to one another in such a way that the fear of the Lord is revealed. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked between one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Now there's a grave error that's occurring in many people's thinking. They think that God is just like they are. They think that God is passive and that God is permissive and they fail to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. But friends, God is holy. The word holy means other than. He is separate from this universe and its values. He's even beyond time and space. And yet, he has values. He's holy and he has values. And he has a purpose that he's working toward. That is that his son Christ Jesus inherit everything. Christ is intended to be Lord over all of the nations. So, the Father says, you will again distinguish between the wicked and the righteous. Now that means we're going to become like him because God distinguishes between the wicked and the righteous and the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. There is a clear line of demarcation. Now our challenge as humans who believe in Christ and follow God is to have these values but not become like Pharisees. And uh, by the way, you'll notice over in Matthew 24 in the New Testament, Jesus begins to sound like John the Baptist or like Elijah calling fire down from heaven. And he did this upon those who were Pharisees and Sadducees, those that judged others uh, as though they were God judging the wicked. We need to separate the values that God gives us, yet show mercy to the people that we need to see saved and repent and return to the Lord. You can never witness or love or pray for people that you hate. There's no room for hatred or racism in the body of Christ. The heart of a Christian is filled with compassion. Even while he sees the sin, our role is to intercede for the sinner. In Malachi chapter 4, it goes on to say that in this setting in which God begins to judge, because again, God has values, He's a king who rules wisely, 
His throne is a throne of mercy, but God also is a God of justice. If you recall over in the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, God begins to identify categories of people that have self-identified and have put themselves in the place of liars and unbelievable uh, unbelievers and abominable and uh, those that adhere to such wicked things they will not have any place in heaven or in the kingdom of God they have self-identified themselves as being haters of God and so ultimately God gives them what they want separation from him in eternity he says the day is coming burning like a furnace and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. Now see the two categories that will be chaff. Chaff is the exterior hull of the wheat. Whenever it's, uh, the wheat is smashed and the hull comes off of it so that the edible part can be processed because the hull is not nutritious. Whenever that, that uh, separation occurs, wheat from chaff, the chaff is uh, is extremely ignitable. It's like gunpowder. Grain silos filled with grain that still has chaff in it have exploded ex in a dramatic way. So the chaff will burn, and he says, that day will be coming, will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. The separation and a judgment is coming, and the two categories that are going to suffer the fire of judgment are the arrogant and the evildoer. Verse 2, but for you who fear my name. Now this is what keeps you from being arrogant or keeps you from being a wicked person. I didn't say a perfect person because being righteous isn't the same thing as being perfect. In fact, being blameless before God isn't the same thing as being perfect. We always will need to walk in humility and confession before God and have an honest and tender heart before the Lord. Because we will stumble, we'll offend others, or we'll take up an offense, we'll misbehave, but the, the cure is to repent and return to the Lord. Jesus is a very good Savior. He restores those that are fallen. His purpose, even when he disciplines anybody, uh, in, in, that I've experienced discipline in my life from the Lord, it's always been to restore us, not to condemn us. The big separating degree ingredient here is whether or not you believe in the Lord and keep returning to the Lord. So he says, but you who fear my name, if you fear his name, that's the big determining factor. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. Wow, what a blessing. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. That's a joyful situation. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Now, there can be long periods of time in which you may think or feel that God isn't doing anything. But yet, inexorably, behind the scenes, the God of all righteousness, the God who wants his son Jesus to be honored among the nations, the God who says, you and your children belong to me, they don't belong to the world. They don't belong to the state. They don't belong to the devil. They don't even belong to you. You're a steward of your children. You and your children. You're a steward of your own soul. It's all been bought with the price of the blood of Jesus. He's the inheritor of everything. And you have to behave like someone who's going to give an account to the one who comes back and says, where is mine? What did you do with it? He says, Verse 5, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else there's going to be a curse that comes on the land so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now look, the Lord always has a goal in history, and that is that it concludes with Jesus Christ being Lord of all. One of the chapters in my book here that um, I'm working on, I've got a draft of it. It's called Elijah, an intercessor for our times. Um, there's so much the Lord's reminded me that applies to exactly what's going on, and I want to repeat the offer 
This is a time limited offer because when I finish this book, it'll be up on Amazon and you'll need to purchase it. But I'll send you a PDF draft of Elijah and Intercessor for our times. Yeah, he said there in the last verse of the last book of the uh, last part of old, the Old Testament, he said, judgment is coming and you need to be ready, you need to repent, and I'm going to send Elijah. Now, Elijah did come. He came in the form and the person of John the Baptist, a forerunner of Christ. Elijah pointed out Jesus. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But that spirit and power and anointing that was on Elijah was so powerful, it called people to repent. It called people to turn away from their wickedness and their arrogance and to kiss the Son. That phrase, kiss the Son, implies a worship of the Son of God. If you fear the Lord, you'll worship the one that He cherishes. And God the Father cherishes His Son, Jesus Christ. God the Father is jealous that His Son inherit the earth, and especially the nations. As Psalms 2 says, Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. And the anointed is in capital letters, that's Christ Jesus the anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Now the fetters and the cords are those things that restrain the wicked. And the saints of God on the earth, by their prayers and pray, praying, by their decrees, by their prophetic intercession, restrain the forces of wickedness. Lawlessness and wickedness is rampant in the cultures of the earth today. We see it especially here in America, casting off all restraint um, in many, many methods and ways. We see the evidence of this. And we see it marching in the streets, causing ruin and destruction. We see it in the legislatures that are willfully allowing late-term abortions. And there's such arrogance and wickedness and lawlessness in their hearts. Most of it is motivated by greed and coveting for power. And yet, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me... I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. The king of glory is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the king of a kingdom, and he is the Lord of hosts with angels at his beck and call. And I'll tell you what, angels are not little weak uh, cherubs, like little ceramic figures sitting on a bench. Angels are mighty warriors with drawn swords. And people die whenever the words of angels are spoken to them if they don't repent. The words of angels are held steadfast by God. And it's a, it's a fearful thing for God to release his angels into the earth. But Matthew 13 says there is a sorting and a shifting coming. And the angels are the harvesters. And those that are chaff are going to be separated from the wheat. The wicked are going to be separated from the righteous. It's a fearful thing to fall into God's hands and not have a Savior. Friends, I'm calling upon you to repent and turn to the Lord. This, these are serious days. The Lord says, I've installed my king. I will tell the decree of the Lord. And he says to his son, Jesus, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. That speaks of the resurrection day. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and as the very ends of the earth as your possession. Now look, there's a prophetic word in the anointing and power of Elijah that's coming forth. And the Lord, who, the Lord of history, the Lord who's ordered your steps and determined your days, also sets the boundaries of the nations. And um, wicked people rise up and shake their fist at God, just like Baal and Jezebel did at the God of Israel. And as they tried to destroy Elijah, the messenger of God, but I want to tell you, history shows us that God wins. God wins every battle that he gets into. He's not afraid of a good fight. But the issue is, will you be a part of that good fight? Will you have faith to believe God, to fear him, to hold fast to his word? History can be changed. Uh, it's not fatalistic. 
History is held in the hands of the prophets. By the word of the Lord, boundaries, seasons, epochs are established. And by the word of the prophets who decree God's will, seasons change. And I want to tell you the season is changing. The axe is laid to the root of the tree. The things that you could escape with and get away with are no longer so. And the Lord of Judgment is watching and he's listening. And it's time to hear the word of the Lord and turn to God with all of your heart. Find apostles and prophets and teachers of the scriptures and gather with them. Don't settle for religious organizations or the old way of church as usual. The season has shifted. That won't be sufficient for you anymore. Find prayer partners and people that will edify you and even confront you if you need it so that the truth can cleanse you. The washing of the water of the word will keep your life clean before God. These are wonderful days to be alive and to watch the Lord Jesus. Uh, friends, we're like, we're like those followers of Moses who walked up behind the Red Sea with the armies of, of uh, Egypt behind us, and it appeared like an impossible no-win situation. But then God said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God says, I've got this. And those that have faith, who've latched on to the eternal, who are listening to God, who've seen a glimpse of his glory, they know nothing is too difficult for God. I would encourage you to subscribe to this channel so you'll get the next video that I send out. I also want to ask you to send me an email and just let me know that you want to get this, Elijah, an intercessor for our times. It's about a 100-page book. I'll send it to you as a PDF, kind of in a condensed format. Be easy for you to read on screen or print out. And uh, I want to encourage you to read. And it's all about prayer and how to intercede with the faith of Elijah, who's an example of praying the prayer of faith. You need to know how to do this for your own sake as well as for the church, the body of Christ, as well as for our nation and its welfare. So hit the subscribe button, share this video with your friends, send me an email, and the email will be in the notes underneath this YouTube video, and you can be able to obtain this free PDF. I'll send it back to you by return email. God bless you. This is Ron Wood saying so long.